Welcome back, honors. Mmm. Yep, it's the weekend. Thank the Lord. At least we're coming up on like a little baby half week though, right? Going into school. But let's pick back up where we left off in class talking about the Persian Wars, right? Really, really fast. Let's go ahead and give some backstory to this whole thing that I forgot to tell you about in class because it's super, super important. Um, where we get all the information for these things. Uh, so I'm sure some of you at some point have thought about a lot of the different things that I've been talking about in class. They're like, how do we know that any of these things happen for sure? Well, the one specific person that gave us the account of all the Persian Wars is actually a, the first Greek historian. So somebody would, well, some, many would consider him the very first historian, period, right? His name is Herodotus, all right? H-E-O-R-D. Uh, I think it's D-U-T-U-S, all right? Now, he actually wrote all of these things down in his account called the Persian Wars, right? Now, the thing about it is, is modern-day historians and revisionist historians would not consider this a set of wars. We would call it a revolt and two invasions, right? And right now, we're talking about the first invasion or we're getting into the motive behind it. They all, also, just to give you like a little bit of depth of knowledge, first of all, a lot of the details that we talk about in certain battles and things like that, and certain numbers and things like that, or stories you've heard, are probably a little exaggerated, right? Because Herodotus probably wasn't there for all of it. He was probably hearing some of it by word of mouth. People tend to exaggerate things. Also, there's a lot of Greek bias involved in all of these things, right? Whenever you like hear about the Persian Wars from Hollywood or talking about it from Herodotus, the Persians are the bad guys, the Greeks are the good guys, and everything about the Persians is terrible and everything about the Greeks is great, right? Well, not really the case, right? Because remember, if we don't, if we recall looking back at like Cyrus the Great, which the Old Testament loved, right? The Jews were big fans of Cyrus the Great. Um, if you look back at uh, looking at Xerxes, looking at Zoroastrianism, their faith being monotheistic, looking back at the fact that, and I don't know if I told y'all this, the Persians specifically preached against slavery, whereas the Greeks thought it was like the best thing since PETA. You know what I mean? Like it was a big, big deal to them. So really looking at it, when you're talking about human quality of life, your life quality was better in the Persian Empire than it was if you were a woman or a slave in the ancient Greek Empire. So there is a lot of bias in this sense, right? There's actually this huge revisionist debate going on right now is what well, would the world be better if the Greeks had lost, right? Well, we'll never really truly know. It's all just conjecture. However, one big thing Herodotus gave us about this account is that whole master remember the Athenians thing, right? Where apparently a servant came up to him every day before he would eat and be like, master, remember the Athenians three different times, right? Well, also apparently, according to Herodotus, Darius walked outside before he invade Gre invaded Greece and took a bow and arrow and shot it into the sky trying to fire it at Zeus. So... You know, like, it's probably not all completely factual, but we're going to talk about it like it is because it's some good stories. Now, getting into it, though, these invasions also, so you see where it says Second Persian War, don't write that, write the First Persian Invasion, right? These invasions were short, all right? They only lasted for small amounts of time. They were usually characterized by smaller cities being crushed by Persian invaders and big, decisive battles, right? Very Napoleonic in a sense, right? Napoleon loved big decisive battles. So the big decisive battle that occurred in the first Persian invasion was the Battle of Marathon, right? A big, like stinky plain of land that nobody actually wanted because it's mostly marshes and a shoreline 26.2 miles away from Athens, right? So what ended up happening in this battle I wish, I wish, I wish I had a whiteboard that I could draw this for you, but I don't, which is a giant pain in the butt. But just imagine this with me, if you will, all right? What apparently happened at the Battle of Marathon is the Greeks were heavily outnumbered, heavily outnumbered, right? Literally, the Persians had apparently like 10 ships reinforced with 100,000 oarsmen and slaves, and then also they had multiple thousands, the 25,000 number of foot soldiers, Ironically enough, no cavalry with them, which is very un-Persian-like, but anyway, keep going. And the Greeks only had 10,000 troops, right? So heavily outnumbered, more so than two to one, right? Which, in the grand scheme of ancient warfare, is a heavily, like, heavily, heavily, heavily outnumbered. You'll notice right here as well, there's limited detail. Write down some of the details I'm about to tell you. Well, what ended up happening is apparently, according to Herodotus and according to many other historians, it's mainly due to the fact that the Persians did not bring their cavalry with them, right? So 
here's the thing about a hoplite. A Greek hoplite soldier is vulnerable to one thing. Cavalry, right? Because it, it takes the, the armor that they wear and uses it against them. Okay, they're not as fast as a horse, a horse like an actual horse-mounted soldier. A horse-mounted soldier is actually also on an elevated plane where their spears have a harder time reaching him. Not to mention the fact that a cavalry member can bowl right through them, right? So, but Persia didn't bring their cavalry with them this time. So when the Persians unloaded their vessels onto the shores outside of Marathon, the the Greeks actually set up like a big wall of shields in three separate areas, so three little lines, to try and make their numbers look a lot bigger than they actually were. And as the Persians amassed on the shore, here's the thing. The hoplites were wearing bronze armor, bronze helmets, bronze shields, and using bronze spear bronze and iron spears as well, right? So they were heavily armed. The Persians favored lighter warfare. They were wearing leather, chain mail if they had it. You know what I mean? They used wicker shields. Ooh, like so the Greeks were just much more heavily tactically like formed. They used those no those lines to try and make their numbers look bigger. And what they did is out of a fit of rage, the Greeks just charged straight into the middle of the Persian forces, trying to make it so their better troops would actually amass in the middle, okay? So while they did that, the middle line of Greeks went, whoom, and just came flying down onto the beach and punched all the way through and then turned around and came back and set their line back up again on a ridge above the beach, while the other two Greek lines outflanked the Persians and started lighting them up with bows and arrows from above, from above and throwing spears at them. The Persians were so freaked out and in hysterics that they tried to retreat back to their ships and ended up getting picked off and slaughtered apparently by the Greeks, right? According to Herodotus, only 100 Greek, 196 Athenians died compared to the 6,000 Persians that died. Now, we know this is probably an exaggeration. More than likely what ended up happening is maybe 1,000 like, uh, Athenians died. They sank like seven of the Persian ships. They did a lot of crazy stuff. But all in all, the big deal about it is the Greeks won when they really, really shouldn't have when looking at the math of the entire thing. And here's the story behind it, right? Known as the Battle of Marathon, this guy, one of the Athenian soldiers, like, go, runs 26.2 miles barefoot back to Athens to proclaim, his name is Phytopedes, by the way, Phytopedes carries the message of victory home 26 miles of distance, says, rejoice, we have conquered Nike, and then goes, Poof, and falls out dead in the middle of the floor, right? So is the story according to Herodotus, which is hilarious, um, because ironically enough, he just did it and ran all the way back, but then it killed him. So anyway, continuing forward, um, now we've got to get into results of that first Persian invasion. Again, you see Second Persian War, ignore it. Don't write that, okay? Just write results of the first Persian invasion, right? So the big results, though, of this is now that the Athenians have had a major victory, uh, they're actually going to build up a fleet of faster ships to prepare for another attack. They were very, very confident that winning this unmatched attack was going to garner yet another Persian invasion where they were right. It would actually do this. Also, the Athenians are going to begin to ask other city-states to form the very first military alliance, the very first that the Greeks have ever seen, because due to the fact that all the Greeks were different city-states, they never even called themselves Greek. They were like, I'm Athenian, I'm Spartan, I'm, I'm a Thebe, I'm like blah, 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 blah. I'm from Corinth, I'm from Megara, I'm from Milos, right? So they would never say they're Greek. However, these victories led to them considering themselves Greeks, right? Now, really, really quickly, though, Two things about that first Persian invasion in the Battle of Marathon. Let's talk about number one, somebody wasn't there. Who wasn't there? Very nice job, Sarah. I heard you back there. The Spartans weren't there because apparently, according to Herodotus, they were in the middle of a religious festival and so they refused to go. Right? So, and they actually weren't even involved in the first Persian invasion. And then in the second, or excuse me, second thing you need to know is the type of vessel that the Athenians would begin to build up. And I know Dean's freaking out. All right, so they're called triremes, right? T-R-I-R-E-M-E. -E. It's an offshoot design of a Phoenician vessel made for a military purpose. It's got two distinct add-ons to it. Number one, it's got portholes for oarsmen that can actually row the boat without wind. Second of all, or three actually, three additions, it's got a second sail so it can actually move faster and turn easier. And then the third thing is the design of the front of the ship, right? They would actually paint eyes onto it so it would look more intimidating. And also they would build a wedged front and underneath the water right here in front was a huge battering ram. 
So they wouldn't have to worry about actually lighting, like boarding the other vessel. They would ram into the other vessel, pop a hole in the hull of the Persian vessels, and they would actually sink. That's, an, that's a Greek trireme vessel, right? So the Athenians built up a massive fleet of these things. Now, then there's going to be the second Persian invasion. The big cause of that is Persian revenge, right? And the Greeks catch word of this because Xerxes, the current king of Persia, sends emissaries to all the Greek city-states and tells them because he knows that the Athenians are creating these alliances, right? He goes to the Spartans, he go, or he sends emissaries to the Spartans, he sends them to the Athenians, he sends them to the people of Milos, to the people of Thebes, to the people of uh, all kind everywhere. Uh, Corinth, Megara, like he sends all these emissaries, he's like, lay down your weapons and join us and we will spare you. Well... The Spartans were not too happy about the fact that they were being threatened into trying to surrender, right? So not big fans of it at all. So what's going to end up happening is the Persians try to actually invade this time by land and by sea, right? So they come after Athens by land and by sea. The Athenians call for help. The Spartans answer. And some of the major battles include the Battle of Thermopylae. Of course, according to Herodotus, there was 300 Spartans, and they, like, bravely, blah, 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 blah. But let's talk about what actually happened to the Battle of Thermopylae. According to like, what actually happened to the Battle of Thermopylae, they were led by King Leonidas, right? The Spartan king. Now, according to the movies, everybody's got a six-pack. You know what I mean? Nobody wears shirts. Uh, the Spartans are, like, well, the one thing the movie got right is they were great warriors. One other thing they got wrong, though, is Gerard Butler, who was, like, late 30s in that movie. Now, King Leonidas was 60 years old when this thing happened, okay? So what ended up happening in this entire thing, though, is they went to the plain of Thermopylae, and there were two battles going on at once in Thermopylae. There was a naval battle going on off the shore, as well as the one going on with the Spartan foot soldiers. Also, the Spartans had a lot of other Greeks with them, right? So they had about 6,000 total Spartans and their allies, right? The legend goes, though, that 300 of them defended the pass as the rest were treated, okay? Because according to Spartan law, should you know a battle is unwinnable, you should retreat back to save the reserves and save the, like, the Spartans. However, this battle is going to lead to that big old, like, romantic idea that Spartans never retreat, right? So, well, what ended up happening is Xerxes actually amasses a huge force of uh, Persian military, in Thermopylae at this very narrow pass, right? Because it goes mountains, a very narrow pass, and then the ocean right there, right? The, so what the Spartans do is they set up their phalanx in that narrow pass to use the geography as an advantage because the Persians, as they would come in, would get bottlenecked in front of the Spartans and they would make it very easy for them to actually pick them off one at a time. It's a genius strategic move, right? Because in the first day, the Spartans shredded the Persian advances. The second day, shredded the Persian advances. Apparently only like 20-something Spartans died while 30,000 Persians died. So that's insane. But then the ultimate betrayal happened. This guy named Ephialtes, right? This like He actually thought he was going to get a reward if he told the Persians some stuff. So he actually goes up to Xerxes and tells them about a narrow mountain pass where they can actually go up and get the one weakness of every single phalanx of the Greeks. It's flanks, right? So the Persians end up surrounding the Spartans, and on the last day, Leonidas hears that they're coming, and he says, everyone, now's your chance to retreat. And 300 Spartans, along with about 1,000 Thebians, actually end up trying to defend that area. The Thebians eventually retreat. All of the Spartans die, along with Leonidas, trying to allow the other people to retreat so they could save themselves, right? It's a very noble way to go out. But following the Battle of Thermopylae and the loss at the, on the coast, uh, Athens is going to be burned to the ground. But in the, at the end of it all, the Strait of Salamis is going to be the big deal, right? Known as the Battle of Plataea as well on the ground, but the Strait of Salamis was crazy, right? The Strait of Salamis or the Battle of Salamis was when the naval battle fleet of the Persians was lured into a strait of water. Again, geographic advantage, right? They had so many more vessels than the Greeks even had close to, but they lured them into this little strait and they blocked them off on both sides to take their numbers and turn them against them. And they ended up using their triremes to sink the entire Persian fleet. So also at the Battle of Plataea, the Greeks actually spread the Persians out of their camp and then forced them to retreat and then cornered them in their own camp and slaughtered all of them. Crazy, crazy big victory. But that's the second Persian invasion, right? And the results of these things, the Athenians are going to increase their status among the city-states, right? Athenians wants to create a permanent alliance with the city-states, but then with them, them at the head of it. I mean, also, all things considered, their city had just gotten burned to the ground. So, you know, whatever. 
Sparta, though, is not happy about this because they think that Athens is trying to make a power grab, and they're not wrong, right? So, so what Athens does is they decide to form the Delian League, right? The very first large-scale military alliance the ancient world had ever seen, right? So the alliance was headed by Pericles of Athens, right, to defend from further Persian invasion. They collected dues from their members, but here's the big problem. The money was not actually used to build up the military. The money was actually being used to rebuild Athens. And when we talk about classical Athens and you see where some of this money went, you can understand why Sparta would have been really, really frustrated with the fact that they think that, Sp that Athens is trying to take over the entire area. Also, the Athenians said for you to actually be able to be in the Delian League, you had to have a democracy. And Sparta refused to do that. They were like, we have a kingship of two kings, the Council of Elders is what we've done for hundreds of years. Leave us alone, right? So, boom. Bang! In a nutshell, that is the Persian Wars right there, right? So, go west, boo the east, as according to Herodotus, as we know that that's not necessarily true, right? But, massive, massive, massive part of uh, Greek history right there. Super important. Um, and this will actually lead up to classical Athens, classical Greece, because these conflicts mark the a long period of peace for the, for the Greeks, where they actually didn't have to worry about defending from invasion, and they could focus on their culture, right? So, We'll talk about that in class on Monday. I will see you guys then. Have a great weekend. Go birds, baby.